Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast, wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Be like Bert. When there is a flash, duck and cover and do it fast. On Addict Selsum, we have seen that Cold War and sport go together like peanut butter and jam, from track and field to water polo. At the time the Beatles broke up and Aerosmith was formed, no discipline was more intertwined with international politics than the game of chess. In chess as in politics, the greatest opponents often come from within. This is a story of geniuses, egos, and national honor in a world where one wrong move can change the course of a lifetime. Let's go back a bit. At the end of World War II, the game of chess enjoyed unrivaled popularity. A new era had just begun. While the Soviet Union had boycotted all Olympic Games before the war, Moscow decided to bring the Cold War to the world of sports. The first post-World War Chess World Championship was organized in this context. Defending champion Alexander Aryekhin having died two years prior, a tournament was organized in 1948. Soviet masters Mikhail Botvinnik, Vasily Smilsov and Borkeres made the top three. This tournament is at the image of the decades to come, an unchallenged Soviet domination linked to controversies concerning the results. Indeed, the Soviet Federation is accused of deciding in advance the winners of matches between its nationals to maximize their chances of victory. In any case, Soviet grandmasters will crush international competitions in the decades that follow. Mikhail Botvinnik, nicknamed the Engineer, is one of the fathers of the Soviet chess school. Endgame genius Vasily Smilsov ended Botvinnik's 10 years dominance with flashes of tactical genius. Tactics were also Mikhail Tal's strong suit, the magician of Riga who learned chess at the age of five during the German occupation of Latvia. Tal's chaotic style of unparalleled creativity at the highest level makes him one of the most studied players in history. Tigran Petrosian, the boa constrictor, named for his ability to slowly smother his opponents, was world champion for most of the 1960s. Last but not least, Boris Paski survivor of the siege of Leningrad when he was only five years old, reached the top of the chess world after beating Petrosian in 1969. A few months later, the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon. While the Soviets were and would remain at the forefront of space technology well into the 1980s, the Americans are, as we saw in the Lake Placid video, winning the narrative war. You can find this video and many others in the Sports and Cold War playlist in the description. Please also make sure to subscribe and hit the bell if you haven't already, as it would tremendously help the channel. Let's go back to the 1960s. Although the USSR became the first and for a long time the only nation to be able to build space stations, although the Soyuz rocket remained the most reliable for more than 50 years after its conception, nothing that the USSR could achieve in terms of space conquest could match the echo of the Apollo missions. Similarly, on the chessboard, a boy from Brooklyn is about to shake up the legacy of the greatest chess nation of all time. At the 1971 Candidates Tournament, which will decide Spassky's opponent, the Soviets lined up four grandmasters out of the eight contenders. In Vancouver, sensation comes from the American Bobby Fischer. If no one is surprised to see him win the competition, results are unbelievable. After 6-0 victories in the quarterfinals and the semifinals, scores that have never been seen at this level, Fischer beat Petrosian in the final with a score of 6.5 to 2.5. To better understand this phenomenon, let's go back a bit. Bobby Fischer was born on March 9, 1943, in Chicago, to a Jewish mother and an unknown father. The young Fischer showed his incredible chess potential at the very young age. He became famous in chess circles at the age of 13 by winning a game against Donald Byrne, 26, winner of the US Open three years prior. The game, known by the somewhat exaggerated name of Game of the Century, ends with a remarkable Quinn sacrifice from the young teenager, proof, in addition to his tactical finesse, of an ability to rise to the occasion. Fisher became US champion in 1958 at only 15 years of age. While the United States have never been a chess juggernaut, Fisher finished ahead of Samuel Reshevsky, American of Polish origin, one of the best players in history to have never been world champion. That same year, Fischer became the youngest international grandmaster in history. 
He learned Russian to improve at chess and did his best to gather the little data that passed the Iron Curtain. Information is king in chess and it is essential to memorize as many openings and positions as possible, especially since the theory is rapidly changing in the second half of the 20th century. Knowing an opponent's style of play is essential to have a chance of winning. This is especially the case during a world championship, where two players face each other for more than a month. Indeed, while the Soviets have access to all the games played by Fischer since his teenage years, he can only analyze the rare games played by the Soviets on the other side of the Iron Curtain. The content of the majority of the games played in the USSR is not made public. 1971. If Fischer is not the contender for the world title, the world championship remains to be organized. It is the first time that two contenders are not from the Soviet Union since the end of the war. While all prior tournaments had been held in Moscow, Fischer categorically refuses to travel to the Soviet Union. The championship will be organized in a neutral country. Belgrade is considered for a time, but Reykjavik is ultimately chosen, despite logistical problems caused by the organization of one of the most important sporting events of the decade in a city of 100,000 people. Once the host city was decided, Fischer delayed the organization of the tournament with numerous modification requests. His first demands were financial. He demands a 30% share of the television rights for players. After his request was granted, Fischer continued to ask for new ones, so much so that many believed that the championship would ultimately be cancelled. The situation was such that Henry Kissinger, US national security advisor, had Fischer on the phone several times to convince him to play a championship of paramount importance for Washington. If many believed at the time that Fischer's aim was to destabilize Spassky and the Soviet delegation in general by his erratic behavior, we can safely argue with regards to the rest of his life that his behavior was the simple result of his growing paranoia. Be that as it may, Fischer's never-ending demands had an impact on Spassky's preparation. The American boycotted the inaugural ceremony. The mood of this very peculiar championship has been set. If this is the first post-World War championship that will interest a wider circle than that of chess, it will be far from being the last. Fischer arrived nine minutes late for his first game. On the 29th move, in a relatively clear endgame leading to an easy draw, Fischer loses his bishop in a blender unworthy of his level. The reasons for such a mistake remain unknown to this day. Fischer explained that he had been distracted by the noise of the cameras and demanded that they all be removed. While the financial sustainability of the competition depends on television rights and after measures concluded that the cameras were inaudible, his request was rejected. Fischer responded with a forfeit in the second game, 2-0. Although this is not a decisive advantage as Paskey needs 12 points to win counting draws, his lead is significant. Anatoly Karpov later said that the forfeited game was Fischer's masterstroke, as Spassky, who has managed to keep focused until then, lost his concentration at that point. While most believe that the match will be won by Spassky by forfeit, Fischer receives another phone call from Kissinger asking him to continue the match. Losing by two points but having managed to throw his opponent off psychologically, Bobby Fischer begins a historical comeback. He wins 7 out of the 19 remaining games for 11 draws and only one defeat. Fischer becomes the first American world champion in history and the first non-Soviet since World War II. Faced with the biggest humiliation of their history, the USSR chess world intends to regain control three years later. Of the eight participants in the 1974 candidates tournament, five were Soviet, including former world champions Boris Spassky and Tigran Petrosyan. The final sees Anatoly Karpov, a 23-year-old young grandmaster, face off against Viktor Korchnoi, 43. Karpov wins and will carry the hopes of Russian chess on his shoulders. While the world is eagerly awaiting the USA vs USSR rematch, Fischer, who has not played in official competition since his world title, demands that draws no longer be counted and the champion be the first to 10 wins. This request is reluctantly accepted by Fide. Fischer goes further and demands to keep his title in the event of a 9-9 draw. The organizers refuse. Karpov becomes world champion by forfeit on June 1, 1975. Note that the 1975 World Championship was to be organized in Manila in the Philippines. 
President Ferdinand Marcos, who had just declared a state of emergency and assumed full power, saw sport events as a great tool to legitimize his regime on the world stage. The money from the match was then used to organize another legendary event, the thriller in Manila between Mohamed Ali and Smoking Joe Frazier. I'll talk about it in a future video, so please make sure to hit the bell. The rest of Bobby Fischer's life is a cautionary tale. Chased by his demons, he stopped playing chess after 1972. In financial trouble, he agreed to participate in a gala match against Boris Spassky in Belgrade in 1992. If Fischer's victory is anecdotal, the fact that the match took place despite American sections against Yugoslavia led Fischer to renounce his American citizenship. After being arrested in Tokyo with a forged passport, he served a nine-month jail sentence. After requesting asylum in several countries, he was finally welcomed in Iceland in recognition of having helped organizing the 1972 World Chess Championship in the country. He passed away in 2008. While the question remains open until today, it is likely that Fischer would have refused to play the 1975 match even if his demands had been met. Things seem to be back to normal for Moscow. No one suspects that the chess world is about to be shaken once again. Anatoly Karpov is the face of chess in the second half of the 1970s. Young, talented, innovative, his opponent in the candidates tournament, Viktor Korchnoi, is seen as a man from another era. As an international grandmaster and one of the best players in the country, Korchnoi's future stays bright, however. He will teach in one of the great chess academies of the Soviet Union, ensuring that no foreign players can come close ever again. A luxury company car, apartments worthy of his talent, Korchnoi's life will be comfortable. Soviet plans may be flawless, but they pay little attention to the human factor. As we will see, the native of Leningrad is not the kind of man to be told what his life will be made of. Korchnoi feels the wind turning from 1974 and a speech from Petrosian affirming that no one who faced Fischer in the past will ever be able to beat him again. Set on to leave the Soviet Union, Korchnoi is no longer authorized to travel abroad. The situation is clear, Korchnoi is living in a golden prison. The decisive factor will come from the West. Although Karpov and Korchnoi were likely the two best players in the world at the time, their reputation is still limited and many believe that Karpov would never have become world champion if it wasn't for Fischer's retirement. In response, the Soviet Chess Federation decided to send the two men play tournaments abroad to show their level to the world. Korchnoi took part in the 1976 Amsterdam tournament, in which he finished joint first with Tony Miles. After the tournament, Korchnoi asked Miles to write political asylum on a piece of paper. On his way to a police station to ask for asylum, did the 45-year-old grandmaster know he would probably never see his wife and children again? He later confessed that he was unaware of the full consequences of his actions. He just wanted to play chess freely. Let's go back a bit. Viktor Rovich Korchnoi was born on March 23, 1931 in Leningrad. His father was a Catholic engineer, his mother a Jewish pianist. Korchnoi's father died during the siege of Leningrad. Despite a successful career in his younger years, he did not qualify for the final of the World Chess Championship until he was in his 40s, an age at which most players actually start declining in level. At the time of his defection, penniless and without nationality, he quickly felt the wrath of the Kremlin. The strategy is simple but effective. If Korchnoi participates in a tournament, no Soviet player will be sent. While the strategy is effective in most of the big tournaments which need Soviet players to uphold their reputation, Korchnoi has the right to participate in the candidates tournament due to his lost final to Karpov three years prior. Three Soviet players took part in the final. Korchnoi met all three. First Petrosian in the quarterfinals, then Lev Porugayevsky. In the final, Korchnoi beat Spassky on the score of 10.5 to 7.5. The 1978 World Championship will see Karpov and Korchnoi face each other. If Fischer's eccentricities in 1972 have gone down in history, the 1978 match will witness spiritual battles between shamans and parapsychologists and accusations of cheating linked to yogurt cups. Fasten your seatbelts and let me tell you about the dirtiest chess match in history. As should have been the case three years prior, the World Championship is organized in the Philippines in Baguio, in the north of the country. 
Each player has two and a half hours to play the first 40 moves, which leads some games lasting more than five hours. The first player to reach six points wins, draws do not count. This last rule, imposed by Fischer for the non-match of 1975, will have important consequences on the course of the match. Indeed, no one suspects that the World Championship will last three months. Controversies began during the preparations with a debate regarding flags. Then stateless Korchnoi offers to play with the Soviet flag on which would have been written I escaped. After considering a white flag marked stateless, he was finally allowed to use the Swiss flag. The second point of contention concerns the players' chairs. Korchnoi insisted on bringing his own, leading the Soviets to suspect cheating. Korchnoi's chair was dismantled and x-rayed at the Baggio hospital to ensure its conformity. For his part, Karpov, of a more compact stature than his opponent, insisted on bringing a caution to be seated at the same level. The first match took place on July 18, 1978, between Karpov, 27, and Korchnoi, 47. At the opening ceremony, the international was mistakenly played instead of the Soviet anthem. Korchnoi, on his side, asked for Beethoven's Ode to Joy to be played instead of the Swiss anthem. The most chaotic match in chess history begins with a bang. When Karpov asked to be given a yogurt during a game, the Korchnoi camp was shocked to see a blueberry yogurt, seeing it as an obvious secret communication. Karpov was forced to choose which flavor of yogurt would be given to him from this point on. He chose raspberry. The Korchnoi camp later insisted that this request was thought as a mockery of the Soviet demands. On the chessboard, the first seven games are drawn, which are not counting for the score. At the start of the eighth game, Karpov refuses to shake his opponent's hand, which is a first in history. Karpov critics saw it as a strategy against Korchnoi, who is famous for losing his concentration when getting angry. Surprisingly, the referee will not force Karpov to shake hands from this point on. Karpov wins game 8 and leads 1-0. Korchnoi's explanation for Karpov's win is the attendance of the Soviet parapsychologist Dr. Zhukar, whose goal, he claims, is to hypnotize Korchnoi into making weaker moves. Korchnoi asked his wife to sit behind the parapsychologist and kick his seat to distract him. Fearing that his wife kicks would not be enough, Korchnoi appealed to a couple of American yogi to help him block Zhukar. Note that both were under an Indian search warrant for attempted murder. Although both players were equally strong, Korchnoi's longer thinking time pushed him to play his endgames more quickly, losing positions that should have ended in draws and drawing potential wins. By game 27, Karpov leads 5 points to 2 and is only one win away from keeping the crown. A 3 points gap being virtually impossible to bridge, the Soviet delegation is reduced in number and Zhukar leaves the Philippines. Unable to win, Korchnoi throws all his plans away and decides to play completely unpredictably. He plays opening lines that put him in subpar situations for the sake of putting both players in uncharted territory. Mind-blowingly, Korchnoi comes back by winning games 28, 29 and 31. This extraordinary comeback suddenly makes Korchnoi the favorite. To take his mind off things, Karpov goes to see the Basketball World Championship final which is taking place in Manila. He witnesses the defeat of his countrymen against Yugoslavia, while the Soviets had led the entire match. The local authorities announced the extradition of the two yogis who had accompanied Korchnoi. Game 32. Hallowed by an impressive streak of victories, Korchnoi decides to end it and win the title. This is surprising as he's playing with black next, which gives him a disadvantage. Common sense dictates to draw with black and try to win the next game with white. It is reasonable to assume that common sense had left the room between the X-ray chair episode and the yogurt controversy, however. Korchnoi plays the perk defense, an opening he already played in game 18 which ended in a draw. This opening is very rare at the top level due to its risky nature, however. Korchnoi pushes his pawn to c5. Karpov, instead of exchanging, takes the opportunity to advance his d-pawn, leading to a position which gives him the center and which will end up severely limiting Korchnoi's space control. Karpov wins the last game. After 32 games played over three months, Anatoly Karpov remains world champion. Korchnoi leaves the Philippines without attending the official mandatory closing ceremonies. 
The two men met again in 1981 for the World Championship final in Merano, Italy. Korshnoi, then 50 years old, an age at which many players consider retirement, defeated Petrosian in the quarterfinals and Pulegevsky in the semifinals to give himself a third chance to become world champion against Karpov. Unlike 1978, Karpov was clearly the strongest player and he won 6 points to 2. Kolchnoi's career continued until the 2000s. He became the oldest national champion in history by winning the Swiss championship in 2009 at age 78. Viktor Kolchnoi, often described as the greatest player of all time to have never won a world chess championship, died on June 6, 2016, at the age of 85. Karpov continued to dominate the chess world until the mid-1980s and the arrival of a new chess prodigy, Kari Kasparov. Although Kasparov later referred to himself as a dissident against Karpov the Soviet, this is more self-descriptive than factually correct. The traits of the men in this video are often exaggerated in order to fit real stories into overarching narratives. Bobby Fischer, the young man from Brooklyn, symbol of the American dream, who was on the verge of collapsing in the early 1970s, never freed himself from his demons and led a life tormented more by his own delusions than by the circumstances he loved to blame. Boris Pasky, described so many times as a pawn of the Soviets, immigrated to France in 1976, the same year as Korchnoi, and obtained French nationality in 1978. He never again defended the colors of the Soviet Union. Viktor Kochnoi was often seen in the West as a symbol of anti-communist rebellion. In reality, Viktor the Terrible was all but a political figure. He was merely a man whose love for chess pushed him to value freedom above all else. Finally, Anatoly Karpov, the perfect James Bond villain from his modest stature to his razor-sharp appearance and analytical abilities, Karpov was a caricature of the Soviet villain in the West. Russian historiography, on the other hand, remembers the victory of Karpov the worker over the frivolity of Korchnoi. In 2007, while Kasparov was detained for participating in a protest against the Kremlin, Karpov made several requests to visit the fiercest rival of his career. After multiple refusals from the authorities, Karpov managed to illegally send a chess magazine to his opponent. The men in today's video are some of the greatest minds of that generation. Their ability to broaden our understanding of a centuries-old game with brilliant creative efficiency makes them giants in the world of sports. To those who insist on making them the heroes of their ideological camp, however, I will remind you of Fisher's demands to turn off inaudible cameras, X-rayed chairs, thought-deflecting yogis, and many other stories that I still have to tell you. As General de Gaulle said, we do nothing serious if we submit to chimeras, but what can we do without them?